and his name shall be called Prince of Peace. I like peace, but some days it's just hard to come by. Some days everybody around you is fighting, either directly fighting with another person or even indirectly fighting with the whole world. Don't you cross me on a bad day. You know, I can fight along with the rest of them. Lives can be full of strife if we're not actively pursuing peace. And that's just on a small scale. On the large scale, there's countries and cultures. I mean, usually princes and peace, they don't go very well together. Princes wage war. It's what they do. It's a part of their normal everyday study. Their normal experience as rulers of nations in conflict with one another over resources and borders and ideas. It's the poor men and women and children who pray for world peace. And that wasn't any different in ancient Israel. Both individual homes and the nation at large were full of conflict. Sometimes they were fighting with smaller nations around them and sometimes threatened by the larger empires just beyond. And when the Assyrian Empire invaded and conquered Israel, well, you can't say the conquered Israelites had peace then. They were deported and dispersed and they found no peace in foreign lands. So the promise of a Prince of Peace, that must have been much desired. Yes, send us a prince to rule on David's throne, like King David, victorious in war. Except, no, not like King David. For while, yes, he was victorious in war, his household was full of strife. We need a Prince of Peace to rule, not only the nation, but also our homes and our hearts. We need a Prince of Peace who conquers not only the national enemies, but spiritual enemies who trouble and oppress our souls. And even more, we need a Prince who can broker peace between our rebellious souls and the God we're at war with in our own rebellion. And we have this Prince of Peace. For Jesus, has come to reconcile ourselves to God, so we're no longer at war with Him. And He has come to deliver us from evil, so our spiritual enemies may no longer hold dominion over us. And also, He will return. He will sit on the throne of David and rule the nations. But today, He may rule already. He rules in our homes and in our hearts. Jesus, my Prince, Good morning. My name is Thad Lanthrop. I'm the executive pastor here at CIV. I'm glad that you could be with us as we are wrapping up our message series, His Name Shall Be Called. Around 700 BC, Isaiah prophesied this. He said, for to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Each of these names would have been a huge encouragement to the people of Judah when this was written because they were under the rule of a wicked king. He sacrificed his own son to false gods. They were also at war with the nations around them. Take a look at this map of the time of, uh, that we're talking about. Syria and Israel had teamed up to go after Judah. War was going on. The king was not leading the people in God's ways. And Isaiah prophesies that the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father and prince of peace is coming. What excitement for the people to hear of their coming Messiah. Now we're on the other side of this child's birth. So we know that 700 years later, Jesus Christ was born as the Messiah. And in this message series, we've looked at how Jesus is the wonderful counselor. While on earth, he provided perfect, miraculous counsel to people, and he will guide us perfectly as well today. Jesus is also the mighty God. He has the power to do anything that he wants. Now we can find strength in God to face our fears through him. 
Jesus is also the everlasting Father. He loves us perfectly as a Father. He provides, He directs, He protects, and He corrects us. Now today we're going to look at the Prince of Peace that Isaiah prophesied during a time of war for the people of Judah. They're at war with the surrounding nations, but they're also at war with the Creator Himself. The people were told to turn to mediums and not their Lord for the answers, for strength. They were sacrificing their own kids to appease these false gods. And we have some ways that we're at war in today's times. So as we look at the Prince of Peace, we need to think through where are you at war today? Where are we at war today? Where do we need to lean in to the Prince of Peace? There's conflicts in our nation. There's conflicts internationally that, who knows, the United States might join. There's ideological wars going on in our country. Things like this might bring up anxiety and fear, and they are going on. But I don't want to focus in on these broader culture wars or broader wars of nations. I want to focus in on some personal wars that we might have going on. And the first is, are you at war in relationships? Is there a person that you're at war with or people or maybe war is too strong of a word, but there's just this unresolved hurt or conflict with someone that needs to be reconciled as best as you can? Are you stuck in this turmoil of brokenness in relationships? How about with authority? You at war with the authority over you? Is it just really hard and a struggle to follow the leadership that God's put above you? Or how about with ourselves? Romans 7 talks about Christ followers having the struggle. The flesh tugs at us to live life in the world's way. Well, God's way and the Holy Spirit is telling us to to live life God's way. Are you feeling that struggle of the war inside of yourself? Are you losing the war within you and choosing to do things that cause more trouble in your life? Or how about with our Creator? Is there a way that you're at war with God? Maybe you haven't committed your life to follow Christ yet and you're going against God and His ways. Or maybe you know God's way in a certain situation, but you just haven't been able to pull the trigger to trust God all the way in that area. Keep in mind any of these ways that you feel like you're, you're at war currently as we look how the Prince of Peace will lead us to a time of peace. In 700 BC, the people of Judah were thrilled at the promise of the coming child, the Prince of Peace. And we should be thrilled as well because the Prince of Peace is with his followers today. As we dive into understanding the Prince of Peace, I have another question for you. How would you define peace? Typically, the American defines peace as times where the circumstances of life are going well. In fact, that's Merriam-Webster's definition is a state of tranquility or quiet, such as freedom from civil disturbance, or a state of security or order within a community provided for by law or custom. This is how the world at large defines peace. And this is a type of peace that can be produced in the world. But it's a peace dependent upon circumstances. It's it's a fleeting peace. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. And one of the main problems with this definition of peace, and if we're striving for this peace that's dependent on circumstances, is that we feel this pressure to try to create the right circumstances. So we remember the perfect Christmas from years ago, and we try to recreate it like Clark Griswold did in the movie Christmas Vacation. 
And we put this tremendous amount of pressure on ourselves to create the right circumstances for peace and happiness. And it brings the opposite of peace because we're so filled with anxiety over trying to get everything just right that eventually we blow up like Clark does. If you've seen the movie Christmas Vacation. We can do this in our lives as well. We see what we think will give us peace or happiness, and we try to make that happen as much as we can. Well, is that the type of peace that Isaiah was talking about? Or is there something much more that the Prince of Peace brings? The Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew. So let's take a look at these Hebrew words to see if it gives us a little better definition of the Prince of Peace. Uh, Prince is the Hebrew word Sar, and it's official, leader, commander, captain, chief, prince, ruler. So Prince is what we would think, right? It's the Prince or the ruler of something. Peace is not tied to a state of tranquility or quiet in the Bible's definition. Peace is shalom. It's this idea of peace, completeness, welfare, health. So the prince of peace is the ruler of peace. And peace itself is this state of being whole or complete. The peace described in the Bible is a state of well-being. It, it's not situation or circumstance specific. The Prince of Peace, Jesus, it, he is the ruler of peace. Peace is in his domain. He rules peace and he grants it to his people. As you think about Christ's life on earth, peace is probably not a word that you would use to describe the end of his life. He was crucified on the cross because he claimed to be God's son, and he was, but the religious leaders of the time, they didn't, they didn't believe him. They persecuted him for uh, blasphemy, and he was sent to die on the cross, having never sinned. The crowds mocked him. They said, if he really is the Christ, then he would save himself. He died this brutal death on the cross. That is definitely not a state of tranquility or quiet, is it? But Jesus was fulfilling his role as the Prince of Peace. You see, as Jesus gave us the example, doing what is right before God isn't going to always lead to a state of tranquility or quiet. That's a fake peace that doesn't last. Doing what is right before God will lead to a state of complete and wholeness, even when it seems like the world around us is crumbling. And Jesus dying a brutal death on the cross for our sins was what needed to happen to restore sinful man's relationship with God. And peace with God only comes to those who make Jesus Christ their Lord. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Prince of Peace did what we could not do on our own. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This means that all of us have gone our own way. We're all together in this. We have all been at war with God and his ways. So Jesus had to come down to earth, live a perfect life, and die as a sacrifice for our sins. And we can be justified by faith. Not our actions, not our circumstances. Justified by faith. And that faith is in Jesus Christ. I want to invite you to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Today, if you haven't done that, what better time than at Christmas time where we celebrate his birth? The only way 
to true lasting peace is by making Jesus the Lord of your life. If you're ready to be justified, justified by faith, then you can pray a simple prayer that goes with the ABCs. You admit that you're a sinner, believe that Jesus lived a perfect life dying on the cross for your sins, and then commit your life to follow Christ. We've all sinned, and we cannot make up this sin gap between us and God. The Prince of Peace did that for us. We have to recognize that. We, we can't be good enough on our own. We can't do enough good. We can't create the right circumstances so that we're justified before God. Trying to do enough to be justified before God, it just leads to more anxiety and feeling like we never can make it. There's always more to do for God. But being justified by faith gives us the ultimate peace with God. And it can lead us to a state of peace on earth as well. I don't know about you, but I don't always feel like I have peace. I've committed my life to Christ. I'm under the rule of the, the Prince of Peace, but I don't always have this feeling of a uh, that I'm whole and complete. So what are the instructions for how to have peace? Isaiah 26, three and four tells us to trust in the Lord. Isaiah 20, here's what it says. It says, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. Here we see the person that has perfect peace keeps their mind on the Lord and trusts in him. Trust in the Lord is one of those attitudes that it sounds easy, right? I say, oh, I trust God. I trust God with this area of my life. I trust God with my kids, with my marriage, with my, my job. But it's a lot more difficult to actually practice this than to just say that we trust in the Lord. But this is how we have perfect peace. And so we really want to understand what it's talking about here. So I, I have a stool that I have right here. And I've brought it to show as an example of what it means to trust in the Lord. So I can say all day long, I trust this stool is going to hold me up. I can say that all day long. But the only, the only way to really show, and I know you can't see the stool now, but the only way to really show that I trust that that is going to hold my weight is to put all of my weight on it and sit down. This is what it looks like to trust the Lord. We can say that we trust God all day long, but it, when it comes time to really put our weight into God's word, we start to inspect things. Like if this stool looked like it wasn't that sturdy, I'm going to inspect it a lot closer and say, is that really a sturdy stool? Is that, I might wobble it to see if it's really going to hold me. So that's what we do with God's word. When we hit areas, we're like, oh, that's going to be hard to do. So we start to inspect God's word. Is that really what he says? And sometimes we can get stuck in this loop of just inspecting. Is that really what God says to do? And we get stuck there. For me, personal finances has been an area where God has really worked with me to learn how to trust in him in it. When Gina and I were first married, my anxiety level was closely tied to the, our bank account, how much was in it. I just didn't have much faith in this area. I'm a numbers guy. And so I had transferred some of my trust from God to the numbers and how much money we had. So unexpected bills would come in and I would run to my spreadsheets to try to figure out because I'm trying to be a good steward of my finances. And, but it really caused this anxiety in my life. At the same time, we, we, Gina and I had committed to giving a tithe to the church, 10%. Um, and we're, we were choosing self-control not to spend over what we had, but we weren't putting much into savings at the same time. And so here we were 
trying to figure this out, this finances thing. And then God started to put it on our hearts to give some money to some other ministries that had been a blessing to us. And so I started inspecting God's word and looking at it. Is that really in there that we give money to other ministries as well to give over and above what we were already committed to giving? And as I, I looked at this, I also knew that there was this promise from God in Matthew 6, 33 and 34. It says that God will provide for people who seek first his kingdom. The verses before these are talking about not worrying about your clothing or what you're going to eat. And then it summarizes it with this, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Okay. So Gina and I decided, okay, we're going to give this monthly support to these other ministries. And then right when we were about to do that, right when I was going to lean in to God's word and trust in him and do this and see it, how he'd come through for us, Gina got in a car accident. And it was the exact amount, the deductible was the exact amount that we were going to give out to these other ministries. So I started to inspect again. Is this really what God wants us to do? Are, are we really supposed to do this? And, and while I was doing that, I remembered a time in college where there was one of these pass the hat types of things. And so there, it was going around. I usually don't really feel compelled to give to those types of things, but I did to this one. And I only had $10 in my wallet. And I felt like God was saying, give the $10. But I also really wanted a cheeseburger later. And I needed that $10. So I kept it. I kept the $10. Later that afternoon, I received a care package from my parents with $20 in it. God convicted me that I didn't trust him enough to either go without a cheeseburger or trust him enough that he would provide a way for me to go and get that. God showed me my lack of faith and he corrected me. And so remembering that, I wrote those checks as quick as I could. I put my full weight and trust into the Lord. I was still nervous about how we were going to pay for the deductible. I wasn't sure, but I just knew we needed to trust God with this. And God provided what we needed shortly after we sent those checks out. And my confidence in God and, my, and, and in trusting him grew. That's how our faith grows in all kinds of areas in life. We read passages in the Bible like Proverbs 11.25. A generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. And then we have been looking for this quiet night all week. And we're thinking, that's, I just can't wait to get there. I'm so tired. It's going gonna, it's gonna to recharge me and get ready for the rest of the week. But a friend calls us and says, hey, I need some help with this project. So now we have a choice. Are we going to lean into God's word and trust that he's going to refresh us as we choose to refresh others? Or am I going to seek my own way of refreshment? This is how trust in the Lord works. We read God's word. We put it into action in situations where we can't see how this is going to work. And God comes through for us. And our trust in him grows. How about relationships? It's Christmas time. It usually means more time around friends and family. CIV has seven hard attitudes that are the relational values of our church. The first four harditudes are about personal relationships. The last three are more about relating to the church at large. Well, these relational heart attitudes will challenge our ability to trust God. The first one is put the goals and interests of others above my own. That'll challenge you right there. If I put the goals and interests of others above my own, who's going to take care of me? So we have to look and see. Is that really what the Bible says? And if so, 
we put our trust in it, put our full weight into the word of God and see how he takes care of us as we look to the interests of others. Second heart attitude is live an honest and open life before others. That's scary, isn't it? You've been burned in the past by opening up to people. But being appropriately honest with people, that's how you can be cared for. Everybody doesn't need to know what's going on with you, but certain people do in the church so that you can get the love and care that is needed to help you move forward in life. Again, is this really true? Am I going to trust the Lord to be open and honest with people and put my full weight into that? Another is give and receive scriptural correction. That's the third heart attitude. Whoo, another one that's tough. Am I going to trust God with this or to clear up relationships? Oh man, I have to admit that I'm wrong to people. That's what it says. That's what God's word says. And if we lean into these heart attitudes in our relationships, what happens is a beautiful thing. We have so many people at Church in the Valley that have been around for 20, 30 years. And all these people can still relate together in close relationships because they've chosen to practice these four heart attitudes. They've cleared up relationships. And it creates just this beautiful relationships in the church that we can have in our families as well. This is how our faith grows. This is how we learn to trust in the Lord and keep our eyes on him so that we get that perfect peace that Isaiah was talking about. God shows us his ways. We examine them, sometimes very cautiously, but we lean into it and he comes through for us. And then we level up and God shows us another way to trust in him. We lean into him some more and he comes through again and again and again. And as we do this more and more, our confidence in God grows and our eyes stay focused on him and doing things his way. And we find ourselves experiencing that complete and whole peace that Isaiah was talking about. We don't find this peace in our circumstances, but in the sense of well-being and completeness that can only be found through the Prince of Peace. A Christ follower has peace as they trust in the Lord. And another key way that we put this into practice is to give our worries to God. Take a look at Philippians 4, 6, and 7. It says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When we trust in the Lord, we turn to him with the things that are going on in our life. Philippians 4, 6 shows us this. It says, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. God wants us to relate to him, to thank him for who he is and the things that, that are going well in our life. He wants us to let him know of the things that you need. At the Hope Amid Darkness seminar that we did a couple weeks ago, Nathan defined peace as the confidence we have in the midst of trouble. The confidence that Christ followers have in the midst of trouble comes from a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the wonderful counselor. He will guide us perfectly in the way that we should go. He is the mighty God. He is outside of space and time and natural consequences. He has all the power to do anything that he sees fit. He is the everlasting father. He loves us perfectly for 
forever, and he will provide, direct, protect, and correct us. And he is the Prince of Peace. And the Prince of Peace can rule in our hearts. We can experience peace that surpasses all understanding as we lean into God's ways, learn to trust him in situation after situation, and learn to lean into him more and more and more and grow in our faith and grow in the peace that God wants to give us, the confidence in the midst of trouble. That's our Prince of Peace who loves us and wants to guide us and direct us towards those things. Each week we have next step so that you can take in response to the message. And here's three next steps you might want to take. The first is to make Jesus the Lord of your life. If you haven't done that yet, I'm going to encourage you. Take that step. When you do, you enter in to the Prince of Peace's kingdom. You enter in to a domain that has peace that you can't understand. It's not tied to getting the right circumstances to line out for you perfectly. The next next step is to trust in the Lord with fill in the blank. Is there something God's shown you? Maybe it was a way that you're at war with someone and you want to make that right. You want to trust God and make that right or whatever it might be. Take that step. Put your full weight into God's word and trust in him. And then the last next step is celebrate the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, everlasting father and prince of peace with CIV at our Christmas Eve service. Next Saturday at 3.30 and 5 p.m., we are going to have a blast celebrating the birth of the prince of peace. We hope that you can join us as we fix our eyes on the Lord with that Christmas Eve service. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you so much that we can trust you, that you are the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Help us, Lord, to learn how to trust you more and more, to learn how to experience the peace that you offer to us. We want that peace, Lord. We ask that you'd give us it and help us to trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen.